My name is Dan Cameron, by the way. I'm a postdoc here, and I'm very, very happy to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Raina Gordon. So Dr. Gordon is an associate professor at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Um, she's also affiliated with the rest of the university, uh, a whole bunch of places, so the departments of genetics and psychology, the Vanderbilt Brain Institute, the uh, Vanderbilt Kennedy Center, which is focused on developmental disorders, the Curb Center for Arts and, and Public Policy. And when I was reading over affiliations, I was kind of struck. I mean, it's no surprise to those of us who know Raina and her work that she would be in demand, but that it really represented her like exceptionally productive interdisciplinarity. Because looking over those centers and institutes and everything, like that's all reflected in her, her publication record. And she's been tremendously productive. Um, her, it seems like an exploding number of, of papers in the last few years. Her group has been really productive. She has a, um, holds a, a very prestigious NIH award, the, the NIH Director's New Innovators Award. She has a, a super competitive R01 on, on uh, uh, topics that I think we're going to hear about today. Um, and she's also known in our field for being a really like a super supervisor. She's collaborating with many other groups as well as her own group. She's the, the founder and co-director of the Vanderbilt Music Cognition Lab, of course. And she won this year the SMPC um, uh, uh, Mentorship Award. So I think that says something about her, her place in our field as well. So uh, I won't go on too much longer. I could. She does a lot of great things. But uh, let's all welcome Dr. Raina Gordon. Awesome. So, um, and I just want to preface this by saying I'm not as funny as Miriam. <laughs> um, but we do have a great deal of fun together and I've learned so much from her and I've learned a lot about taking a nuanced clinical approach um, and she cheerleads me also. So, <laughs> so it's, it's fun to be here together. So um, my group in the lab takes a really integrative science approach to understanding language and musicality and the brain and our research program has now also come to include complex trait genetics and epidemiology and I hope to convince you today that this is a, re a relevant way um, to think about and explore music and developmental disorders. Okay, I think we all know why rhythm matters. Um, Hopefully the folks at home also know, but we, we know that rhythm is this indispensable aspect of music, a human universal. Um, there's you know, great variability across the continuum of rhythm traits, even among non-musicians. So rhythm is not a, a binary variable. It really exists in, on a continuum in the population. Um, and we want to understand how this occurs. So of course, there are some other reasons why it matters to study rhythm. We saw from Miriam's talk uh, that uh, rhythmic synchronization may pro bolster pro-social behaviors and increase well-being. Um, and then we saw from uh, Barber's talk that um, rhythm can be an important um, key to understanding how we can maybe use music in a clinical speech and language disorder context. So rhythm correlates with cognition, speech and language skills. Rhythm impairments may co-occur with other disorders. And you know we're going to talk about some of that. So um, I also want to make sure, I, I feel like the word musicality means many things to many people, so I've just, I have a quick definition here. So the, the definition of musicality that I'm using today and that I'll refer to at some points is really the, the totality of a person's potential for music engagement and experiences. And that is, is broad and can take the form of training, aptitude, music listening. Um, so I think you know, for people in the audience who are new to this field, you've probably already seen today that we can measure musicality with various tests, neural methods, self-report. Um, and really, I just want to highlight, you know, as um, thinking about this the way Hank Jan Honing defines it, um, we're concerned with musicality, the people part, um, more so than music, the signal on its own, right? But we're talking about how, pe as people, we interact with music. So, so we're going to then explore how rhythm skills, like the, the people part, are related to um, developmental speech and language disorders. OK, so many of you might be familiar with epidemiology research because we are in a pandemic. <laughs> um, but you might not have thought about how it could be applied to something like musicality. So according to the CDC, epidemiology is the study, so the scientific, systematic, and data-driven study of the distribution, that could be the frequency or pattern of the determinants, causes, and risk factors 
of health-related states and events, so not just diseases, in specified populations. But those populations could range from neighborhood, school, city, state, country, or global. A lot of epidemiological approaches use big data, including genetics. So an epidemiological lens is a way of approaching scientific questions about musicality as a health-related state and trying to understand its causal determinants and risk factors using large-scale data to give us insight on how musicality is distributed in the population and how it's related to health, including speech and language skills. And I work in a medical center, so we have to explain a lot how what we're doing is related to health. So every day we have to explain it. So that's good. Um, so there's, so when we think about determinants from the previous slide, those causes and risk factors, um, we've started to think about associations between various musicality and language traits and how those might be causal or correlational. I think earlier frameworks um, often interpreted such associations as effects of training-related neuroplasticity, and I think that's very interesting and, and that work continues. Um, there's also reason to look at really things from a, a, a correlational standpoint, but in a, in a really deep way, right? So um, when, we, when we take a step back, it's becoming increasingly clear that individual differences in music aptitude skills, like rhythm or pitch discrimination or singing, explain some of the variance in many language-related skills, speech perception, reading, vocabulary, spoken grammar, second language learning, like that's a lot, right? So um, we have a, a paper that's just out um, where we identified a large number of studies that really converged on robust associations between musicality and many different domains of language skills, especially music aptitude and language skills. And Shristi Nayak in my lab, who I, I hope is listening, um, I, think she, I think she's attending virtually right now. Uh, she couldn't be here in person, but she's done an awesome job leading that project. Um, and so I'll talk more in, in a moment about the theory that those phenotypic correlations have led us to predict about musicality and language in the population. So the premise then, given that those, that what we call the, phen in genetics we call the phenotypic literature, so the, the behavioral associations that we see, um, we can think about this framing where who chooses music training may not be neutral, there are shared genetic influences on musicality and language that could change the course of language acquisition and result in the associations that we see, right? Um, and even outside of music training, just aptitude, we, we see a lot of associations there. So we've started to look at potential shared genetic influences and how they play out using twin and family-based methods. I won't really have time to talk about that in the main talk, but I'm happy to talk chat about it afterwards. Um, there's large-scale data from Isabel Peretz that shows a greater prevalence of self-reported speech, language, and reading disorders in individuals with time-based musical impairments. So we'll talk a lot about those themes, and I think that study was really important in looking at a large population and, and looking at those, those prevalences, right? So, um, so really, the, a lot of the work that we're doing today, or that we're talking about today, seeks to understand the relationship between language and music, and in particular, rhythm, biologically. And, that's, and here, it's framed at the intersection of an old theory, an old biology theory, and recent biological evidence that phenotypic correlations often reflect shared underlying genetics. And you're going to hear me say that like a gajillion times, so you'll probably be really tired of it by the end. But um, hopefully, you'll, you'll come away with that idea. So we've pulled these ideas together into um, the framework paper I mentioned, Musical Abilities, Pleiotropy, Language, and Environment Framework, or MAPLE for short. Um, no, uh, there's no relationship with maple trees in Canada, but um, since we're here and it's fall, <laughs> it seems exciting the paper's out now. So, um, so here what, what we're proposing is that the phenotypic associations between musicality and language skills will be mirrored in shared genetic architecture between the skills. And then in the paper, we outline ways that we can start to disentangle some of the processes that fall in between genetic variation and the phenotypes that we observe behaviorally, because there, there's a whole lot in there, right? So um, I'll talk in detail about the concept of pleiotropy, shared genetic architecture, a bit later in the talk. But now you'll know that it's coming. So, OK. <laughs> we have a sister theory called the atypical rhythm risk hypothesis. We heard about that um, this morning from Barbara. It was very nice collaborating um, with Barbara and Anna Fivash on this study. Um, and this is based on 
converging evidence linking rhythm to multiple aspects of language development. So we're starting to think about rhythm in terms of identifying risk factors for speech and language disorders. So remember, epidemiology, risk factors, so sometimes causes, sometimes just risk factors. Both are valuable. So we discussed that prospect in the, in the paper, and we talked about elevated prevalence of impaired rhythm skills in populations with speech and language disorders, such as dyslexia, stuttering, we saw in Devin's talk, and also developmental language disorder. And we had predicted that these associations could be a reflection of shared underlying genetics between rhythm and speech language development. See, there, I said it again. Okay, so we made a number of specific predictions about the genetics, and um, Again, we're predicting some degree of shared genetic architecture between rhythm and speech language development that would account for the phenotypic correlations. It doesn't mean that all of the genetic architecture is shared. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit about that as well. Um, I want to start with some, I have some actual new data that I'm very excited to share. Um, so we've started to use population-based epidemiological approaches in large samples to look at risk and resilience for speech and language and reading disorders. Um, so let's see, the, the ends are gonna be probably not readable here, but um, we, um, here we're able to show that, so um, impaired rhythm is coded that way and typical rhythm is coded this way. And we have the first, the top is the Swedish musical rhythm discrimination task in 2,475 people. Um, and then we have some other rhythm tasks, self-reported rhythm abilities, that's a questionnaire, beat synchronization accuracy in 540, and then um, the beat-based advantage test, which is similar um, to uh, what Devin presented on in stuttering. Um, and for all of these, we have there, we've, we're seeing that there's higher um, incidence um, of impaired rhythm. Um, so we're seeing some behavioral association here with, with various rhythm tasks. And then similarly with self-reported dyslexia, all this is, is participant reported. So we're starting to be able to look at these things in large samples and respond at least to some of the epidemiological predictions of atypical rhythm risk hypothesis. But we're gonna get into genetics. Um, so these, so beat synchronization um, emerges very early in development. We've already seen this today. We've seen why, how parents um, and children interact with each other. Um, Miriam explained some developmental reasons why this may be really beneficial. And uh, so I have um, a fun little example of this, um, of kids doing beat synchronization. So, okay, so those were, that was my daughters when they were two and seven. <laughs> they're, they're, they're nine and 15 now. Um, and they were supposed to be getting ready for school, but they, they, this was all spontaneous, I did not say. Seeing ants go marching on while you're tapping your light up shoes. <laughs> it just was a thing that happened. Um, and, and you could tell that like the nine-year-old is like right on the beat and like the two-year-old is, or wait, four, nine and, Sorry, seven and two. Okay, I'm sleep deprived. <laughs> okay, they were seven and two. They're five years apart. Okay, so you can see the seven-year-old Callista was, um, she was like right on the beat, and then at the two-year-old Amandine was a little bit around the beat, but she was, you know, she was like approximating, right? Um, and it's very engaging for them, um, and part of their morning routine, apparently. So, so even in young kids, we're seeing these fundamental properties of beat synchronization, so extracting the beat, meter perception, periodic motor pattern generation, auditory motor, coordination. So it makes me very curious about the biological basis of this trait. So, but what can genomic approaches tell us about the biology of the trait? Well, we can start to examine the genetic basis of individual differences in the trait, really to get a foothold on the underlying neurobiology. And we can start to look at whether, how the genetic contributions affect the neural architecture of rhythm processing. So that's one of the things I'm interested in. And then again, we want to understand this relationship between rhythm and language skills and really what biology could be driving their individual differences or their, their correlations. And could some of the genes that influence rhythm, and I say genes plural, 
um, also influence language traits. So, but concretely, how do we do this? Okay, so I got really interested in looking at this um, a few years ago, back in 2015, um, when I was starting my faculty position. I started to read about genetics. I connected with Nancy Cox, and I went to her with the idea, like, hey, can we like genotype the children coming into the lab for rhythm and language behavioral and brain studies? And like, could we just like look at a couple of candidate genes? And like, I thought I would just like collaborate with some geneticists on the analysis. Um, so. Looking back, <laughs> it's not exactly how things ended up, but I guess that's good. So I was thinking about candidate genes, and I learned that when we're talking about complex traits that don't show a Mendelian pattern of inheritance, that the candidate gene approach in which we would only look at a couple of small regions of the genome might not replicate well in the larger population. So we might need other approaches. And an example of this was with the depression candidate genes. Those were shown by Border et al. in 2019 to not be robust predictors, uh, predictors of depression once they were examined in large enough samples. So then the larger samples did other types of studies and were able to tap into some signal that really replicated well, but it wasn't the original candidate genes that had been um, formulated and pursued. Um, so there's a great article in the Atlantic about that in May 2019. Okay, so Nancy convinced me that we needed to pursue these really well-powered studies. We would need large sample sizes. We would need to do genome-wide association studies. I didn't even know what that was at the time. But fortunately, in the music cognition field, Bruno Jangra and others had been talking about needing to do musicality genomics in large samples. So sort of the timing was good. Sometimes timing works out, right? We can sort of trust the system that you know, eventually we'll be able to look at the questions that we're interested in at the time. <laughs> they're, they're, some, sometimes things are timely. Um, and so at that time, this was really a cool time because advanced genomic methods were sort of coming online and we were able to then also ask bigger questions about the genetics of communication traits and evolution and things like that. So, um, so I started to get really excited about all of this. I got a... Um, I got a two-year career development grant from the NIH that really where I took on learning the methods. Um, and so, yeah, we had that goal. We're going to do large-scale genome-wide association studies. And that's when I jumped in the genetics deep end. Okay, so, so we then, um, so I learned, one of the first things I learned was when you want to know about the genetic basis of a trait, don't start by running out and genotyping everyone. Start by looking at the heritability in family-based studies. So it's always good to take a moment to review what is heritability. Heritability is the proportion of phenotypic variance that's explained by genetic variation. It's not determinism. So there's always genetic and environmental contributions to the kind of traits we are interested in. And it's also not an opposition to culture. So genetics can influence. And genetics can also at times be independent from the cultural experiences that we seek out and create as humans. We could talk about that all afternoon, but, um, but getting back to the heritability of rhythm, there's some really amazing work on this in the Swedish Twin Registry. They've looked at many, many music phenotypes and found some degree of heritability in rhythm tasks. Um, they've also done other studies showing that who pursues music training and how much they practice is heritable. I, I think that's really um, interesting because I tend to think of those as like environmental factors, but they're also genetically influenced. Not genetically determined, just genetically influenced. Okay, so all of that family-based evidence was promising for the success of molecular-based genome-wide studies because it suggests that there are molecular genetic influences to uncover, but we need GWAS, genome-wide association studies, to pursue those molecular genetics. So. Um, And we, so I'll explain to you us in, in a moment. And so you'll see that when we're planning genetic studies, that's, it, there's an iterative process of considering phenotyping, sample size, population, and analysis methods all in parallel. Okay, so we wanted to do a genome-wide association study of beat synchronization. And GWAS gives you the associations between complex traits and genetic alleles at strategically measured genetic markers, or SNPs, all across the genome. So this tells you what genes might influence a trait. So there's only a few key things you need to know about GWAS for the purposes of this talk. 
GWAS uses common genetic vari variation to show us small effects that are widespread throughout the population. You need very large ends to discover these small effects, and GWAS is appropriate for complex traits that are polygenic. So it's important to make the distinction that these polygenic traits, again, have very small effects at a given genomic locus, so they take large samples to detect reliably. Now, we're pretty sure rhythm is a complex trait, so GWAS could tell us about individual differences in rhythm in the population. And there's a great article, um, Uffelman et al., called Genome-Wide Association Studies that really ex explains a lot about the method. All right, um, so I have a few examples and visuals to solidify these concepts. So common variants, small effects, different than rare variants that have large effects, again. Um, when we do GWAS, we get a Manhattan plot, we can do, which is, looks like sort of the skyline over there. Um, and so I have some examples, um, dyslexia cases versus controls. Uh, that's, you, you can do GWAS on a binary trait, but you can also do GWAS on a continuous trait, like a brain trait, or a, a rhythm score, something like that. Okay, any, is everyone still with me? Okay. So again, we're going to focus on beat synchronization. So we were really fortunate to be able to meet our goal of getting to a large sample size by partnering with personal genetics company 23andMe. So 23andMe has data on millions of, of participants, on people who, who have been already genotyped and who have consented to research. So in our study, 600,000 people answered the self-report question, can you clap in time with a musical beat? About 8% of people responded no to this question. And that item became the GWAS for the phenotype study, the yes versus no. And I really like this question sort of intuitively as a starting place for understanding the genetics of beat synchronization, since moving in time with a musical beat is such a common feature of music across cultures, it emerges early in development, and, and we'll talk more about that, how we validated the phenotype in a moment. So um, we officialized our agreement with 23andMe so that they could share their group level summary statistics. They don't need to share the individual genome, so that I think is good on both sides, right? Keeps their data private, and then we have cool group level data that we can do lots of analyses on. So the paper's finally out. It was a long road, um, and I just want to give a shout out to Martha Lewis, the artist that we worked with on the cover art. So I'm going to walk through some of the key results in the first study, and then what we're doing now with that data to look at the shared biology for, potentially shared biology for speech and language disorders. So of course, you're all music cognition people, you're thinking, wow, a valid GWAS of a musical trait really would need a valid phenotype. So my intuitions that this was, this clap in time to beat question was a good question, that's not sufficient. We needed to establish this. So we did two internet-based phenotype validation studies. Um, we worked with Nori Jacoby on this, and in the first study, we focused on rhythm perception, in the second study, which we pre-registered, we actually used a beat synchronization test. We used Nori Jacoby's RET algorithm, REP algorithm to measure the responses, and we were able to test whether the self-reported beat synchronization item would be related to actual beat synchronization. So we did this in samples that we recruited in Mechanical Turk, and um, because we didn't have access to recontact the 23andMe participants, um, but that's good because it's an uh, independent sample replication of the, the phenotype, right? Um, so there's a lot on this slide, but I just want to draw your attention to the beat synchronization results here. So um, is it, let me get this cursor, no, okay. So um, the lower values mean better accuracy. So the beat tapping accuracy is the standard deviation of the asynchrony. And um, you can see that people who responded yes to the self-report were generally much more accurate tappers than people who responded no. So we did a lot of other sensitivity analyses. We controlled for variables like self-confidence, professional musicianship. All those analyses are reported in the paper. Um, and basically from these experiments, we concluded that the self-reported beat synchronization item is a good proxy for measured rhythm phenotypes. At least good enough to do GWAS. So then back to the genomic portion of the study. So this is the Manhattan plot of the GWAS study. And this plot shows us genetic associations with answering yes versus no to that clap to beat self-report question. So in other words, this is the strength of the associations of people's genetic alleles with the phenotype. And you, there's statistical significance is on the y-axis, and then 
um, I don't know if you can see the dotted gray horizontal line is, um, is the, the threshold after multiple test corrections. So, and the dots are genetic markers, um, different genetic markers, and they're lined up on the x-axis by chromosome. So we found 69 independent genetic loci associated with beat synchronization. So beat synchronization is highly polygenic. There are many, many genes involved. And this GWAS is well powered, and then it allows us to do a number of additional genetic analyses that we report in the paper. Um, one of the first things we did was we conditioned or controlled for general cognition. So um, we used a method that allowed us to basically pull out genetic effects of general cognition that had been established in, an, in another GWAS. Um, so that was helpful because it, we saw that there was very little change to the GWAS. So we don't think that these that this is just masquerading as general cognition. We think it's really beat synchronization. Uh, we needed to validate and replicate that in additional ways. And one way that you can do that is to test the model in another sample with polygenic scores. So if you visited Tara's pa uh, poster uh, this afternoon, then you learned all about polygenic scores. Um, so we, if you have a large what we call a discovery GWAS sample, you can then generate the polygenic score model from your GWAS. So this is just the alleles and their weights from the discovery sample. See, genetics is just statistics. You don't even have to know too much biology. Um, and you can analyze each individual then in the target sample, so in a second sample, and you calculate the weighted sum of that person's relevant alleles, and you get a variable, which is a number for each person, that represents that person's genetic predisposition to the trait. That number is called their polygenic score. So um, here, you know, the trait that we're interested in looking at is normal versus impaired beat synchronization. So then you can correlate the polygenic score variable with another variable that was measured in the target sample. For example, a music engagement variable, if that's what you have, or, or something else, right? Um, and polygenic scores work really well when your discovery sample is well powered. So again, we're applying that polygenic score to the genetic data of individual people in a separate sample, and then we test whether it correlates with the phenotype directly measured in the separate sample. Okay, so we did PGS in uh, several data sets. I have, I have two to report here. Um, so we made a polygenic score model for beat synchronization from the GWAS. We applied it to the genetic data of 1,200 patients in the BioView research database. And um, that had been algorithmically identified as musicians, as musically active individuals. And we also applied that model to 4,800 control patients. And so the algorithmic method for the defining that phenotype is um, reported in a separate paper. Um, but basically we found that musically active individuals had higher polygenic scores for beat synchronization than control patients. And we found that just based on their DNA. And then our collaborators who work with the Swedish twin data also applied the polygenic score for beat synchronization to their sample where they have many, many different musicality phenotypes, musicality variables. Um, and that, that paper also just came out um, and that um, shows that the polygenic score for beat synchronization predicts multiple musicality variables, um, including a motor timing task and music practice and uh, achievement in music. So. Okay, so at least we feel like we're getting signal here that corresponds to something valid. Um, but there's so much signal in this GWAS. What do, what, do, what do all these genes mean? What is all of this? So what are the properties of all of these genes, right? Um, so we could look them up one by one, and we always do, but the, many of these genes are involved in many, many biological functions and many different phenotypes, many different health phenotypes. So um, when you do that and when you have a lot of signal, it's, it's not very conclusive to sort of just do it by lookups, right? So then, fortunately, we have many, many other tools at our disposal to answer this question. And one thing that, one way we can explore this is doing a gene property analysis on our GWAS results using the GTEx predictor data. So GTEx is a reference set where gene expression levels are characterized in 54 tissues in the body um, from donor samples. And our analysis lets, will let us see tissue-specific gene expression in relation to our trait, our rhythm trait, but then based only on the GWAS data after it's been analyzed and reduced to the genes and their p-values. So it helps us get to tissue specificity of gene expression and in, in brain tissue and other tissues without directly assaying the tissues in the participants who were um, in the beat synchronization study. So this is one of really many ways we can triangulate between DNA, gene expression, the brain, and rhythm. And 
I, I get very excited because I think it's very cool to sort of have existing data and learn about these ways that you can do the integration to answer questions that you're interested in. Okay, so we found here that the genetic architecture of beat synchronization is highly enriched not only for gene expression and brain tissue overall, as we would expect for any like cognitive related trait, but including for gene expression in cerebellum and cortex and basal ganglia. So we know that those are important in rhythm. And so, you know, um, these results are, are encouraging because of the way that they align with the cognitive neuroscience evidence of the neural substrates of beat synchronization. So when we think about specialized auditory motor networks that are active during various rhythm tasks and play a role in perceiving, anticipating, and synchronizing to a musical beat, um, then this is a starting place, but it really then opens up opportunities to get much more granular, even at the voxel level or at, at other levels with what we call neural endophenotypes, which basically um, neural variables um, that might explain the connection between genetic variation and behavior. Uh, using other types of data in relation to the GWAS data in the future. So I'm thinking a lot about this right now um, and how we can really start to get very precise and um, test some of these hypotheses. So we don't think that these circuits just emerge in adulthood. Again, they develop early, right? Remember the kiddos tapping the shoes. So we, we can start to ask really what I think are very interesting questions. Sorry, I get very excited about all of this. So. I think it's exciting, so um, you guys will judge for yourselves. But um, so how does the brain wire itself for rhythmic input early in development? How, how does genetic variation then influence the neural architecture of the trait, right? So we're able to start using neurogenomic data to look for enrichment in the GWAS. And in the GWAS paper, we report that the beat synchronization um, GWAS is enriched for SNPs or genetic markers that play a role in regulating brain-specific gene expression, especially in the fetal brain. And then in ongoing follow-up work in the lab, we're seeing additional enrichments during stages of prenatal development. So our newest result <clears throat> is enrichment of neural precursor cell types and um, neuronal cell types in fetal tissue, particularly at 26 weeks of gestation, which is a sensitive period in auditory development. So it's very, that's all very preliminary, but, um, or at least the, the data on the right side of the slide. Um, but it, it, we're, we're starting to think about how early these things could emerge and how we can start to do this data integration. Okay, so summarizing what we have learned so far. So our large scale GWAS yielded 69 genomic loci associated with beat synchronization. Beat synchronization is highly polygenic. Um, the enrichment of beat synchronization heritability and gene expression in the brain tissue um, suggests uh, that this is a consistent result with auditory motor networks underlying rhythm. The initial developmental neurogenomic results suggest enrichment in genetic markers that control fetal brain specific genes, gene regulation um, as one of the potential mechanisms. I'm not saying this is the only mechanism, but this, this may contribute to the to the heritability of the trait and to the variation that we see in the population. Of course, the limitation is that the main phenotype was self-reported. It's very simple. The sample was only European ancestry, so of course we need to do future GWAS with other richer phenotypes and more diverse populations. If you're interested in the ethical and social dimensions, um, we have a commentary piece that's currently on SciArchive um, about conduct of musicality genomics. And unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about that, but I am very passionate about that topic as well. Okay, so as a reward for getting through the hardest part of the genetics content, and also because it's like the afternoon, um, if you want to stand up and stretch and move, I have a very brief musical interlude. So this is the dancing fiddler, Hillary Klug. Um, Howdy, y'all. This is so my favorite fiddle tune. a little team. video, Soldier's so Joy. stretch it's a little. the oldest one in the books. <laughs> Thank you. 
of beet processing. Okay, now, so part two, is there shared genetic architecture between musical rhythm and language skills? And you've all, now you've had some rhythmic priming, right? So thank you, Barbara, for teaching us all about rhythmic priming. Um, so you're gonna understand the second part very well. All right, so again, now we're gonna look at um, rhythm and language development. Um, so we made predictions about this in the atypical rhythm risk hypothesis. I wanna talk a little bit about rhythm and DLD. We've been interested in DLD for a long time. So children with DLD have trouble understanding and producing age-appropriate grammar and vocabulary in their spoken language, in their native language. Their struggles with communication have a lot of long-term academic and social consequences, so they often struggle with reading as well. Um, DLD is often comorbid with ADHD and uh, motor impairments, and this is really important because these type of language impairments affect about 7% of school-aged children, and DLD is very often under-identified. So a National Academies report in 2016 pointed to the urgent need to improve identification and service delivery to children with DLD. You can learn more at um, dldandme.org. Uh, it's been a great resource. Okay, so, um, you know, we're talking about epidemiological approaches. So in order to identify large cohorts of children with DLD, um, we, uh, I'll, I'll briefly mention this project we did. Um, since DLD is not represented in the health record in a straightforward way, we created an algorithm that makes use of a series of different language-related diagnostic codes and comorbidities to identify true DLD cases with the plans to eventually use this data to look at DLD and rhythm. Um, but uh, also DLD and other health phenotypes. So I think, I'm, I think this is really important um, to really be thinking about how we can do more research on this, on the DLD population. So through a very long and arduous process, we validated the automated algorithm to identify DLD cases. We're applying that now to data from many different sources, and that's getting us closer not only to understanding the health determinants of DLD, but also as a way to test the atypical rhythm risk hypothesis in medium-sized cohorts of children with DLD who've been genotyped. So uh, we'll be looking um, in DLD uh, to, to test for shared genetic architecture with rhythm impairment. Okay, um, but in the meantime, um, we have some work we're doing where um, we have um, other speech and language phenotypes, um, including, again, this self-reported history of speech language disorder. So we generated the polygenic scores for beat synchronization from the GWAS. We applied them. Again, that's those weighted sum of alleles. We applied that to the, to the target population. And here it was our, um, our Vanderbilt online musicality study. Um, and we are seeing that lower beat synchronization polygenic scores, so on the Im impaired beat synchronization, and that's predicting a higher likelihood of history of childhood speech language disorder um, in this particular sample. So these results are brand new, um, and this is suggesting that genetic predisposition for rhythm impairment might increase the risk of childhood speech and language disorder. There's some other ways we can start to get at these broad questions, and that's using a method called genetic correlation. So if you remember, we talked about pleiotropy a little bit at the beginning. So pleiotropy is when a single genetic locus can affect two separate traits, and there's um, years of biology research showing that cross-trait phenotypic correlations reflect underlying genetic correlations due to pleiotropy. But there was a big advance in genomic methods in 2015 that gave us a method called LD score regression, and that allows us to test cross-trait pleiotropy in data from separate samples, so separate GWASs. So many subsequent studies have used this method to show pleiotropy among cognitive and health traits. Um, people may have heard me talk about this at, at conferences um, you know, over the past year or two, but I just wanted to sort of um, go over it today. So, um, to understand the method. So for example, the GWAS of subjective well-being is genetically correlated with the GWAS of depressive symptoms, which is what we would expect. Um, it's negatively genetically correlated, which we would expect based on the negative phenotypic correlation between well-being and depressive symptoms. So um, there's many ways in which this is being applied. So we looked at genetic correlations between beat synchronization and a number of health and cognitive traits, and we started to find some interesting cross-trait correlations. 
So I'll focus on a few results that involve biological rhythms. So that's circadian chronotype and uh, breathing phenotype. So chronotype is just being a morning or an evening person, morningness versus eveningness. And we ran a number of exploratory genetic correlations. We found that beat synchronization was genetically correlated with evening chronotype. And then we also found that beat synchronization was genetically correlated with another biological rhythm, breathing, um, and in particular, lower likelihood of reporting shortness of breath while walking on level ground. And again, that was in data from separate GWAS studies. Okay? Then we did a follow-up phenotype study where we pre-registered several hypotheses and we tested multiple traits within a single sample, like more sort of traditional psychology style, right? And there we found the same phenotypic correlations mirroring what we had found with the genetic correlations. So um, beat synchronization task performance is correlated with evening chronotype and reduced likelihood of shortness of breath. And, and that um, held up after multiple test correction and controlling for demographic covariates. So you can see, hopefully you can see, how the genetic analyses can generate hypotheses for new behavioral studies. So that's fun. Okay, so of course what you can imagine is that we're going to look at whether rhythm and language are genetically correlated. And what we need is GWAS summary statistics for language traits. And so that, that didn't really exist until recently, but fortunately there um, is a big GWAS project that um, was recently completed with the Genlang Quantitative Working Group led by Simon Fisher and Elsa Ising. Um, and, there, and then there's also another GWAS of dyslexia from Michelle Luciano's group. I had mentioned that GWAS earlier. So um, I also want um, to note that um, language is polygenic. So um, FOXP2 is one of the genes that plays a role in language. Um, rare variants of FOXP2, people always ask about this, so rare variants of FOXP2 can disrupt speech in particular. Um, speech, they can, uh, can be linked to speech disorders. Um, but we're really seeing that language is polygenic like other complex traits in the population. And Simon Fisher has a really great tweetorial about, about I don't know if Twitter still exists <laughs> this afternoon. <laughs> but if you can go and look up Simon's uh, tweetorial about gene for language, it's very interesting. Okay, so um, in the Genlang quantitative, quantitative trait, GWAS, they meta-analyzed data from 22 different cohorts and then so we're accessing some of their, the data from that project. And using that data, we've been able to compute genetic correlations between the beat GWAS and those language-related GWASs. And we're very excited to see significant genetic correlations between beat synchronization and each of the reading-related traits that are listed. So word reading, non-word reading, spelling, phoneme awareness, also with non-word repetition, which is a good spoken language proxy. Um, whereas there was no genetic correlation with nonverbal IQ measured in that same sample. So, um, so we don't think the results are driven or confounded again by general cognition. I'm going to keep you know, thinking about that, though, because it's important in future studies to keep controlling for that however we can. Um, but basically, these results are aligning with phenotypic correlations between reading and rhythm and spoken language that we've seen in other work. All right. So... What's next? Well, genetic correlation in, indicates overall shared genetic architecture, but it doesn't tell us which genetic loci overlap or what those genes do. So um, in ongoing work, we're starting to dig in with other methods to know which genes are shared and what their function is. Of course, language skills exist on a continuum, so um, those types of studies are interesting from a basic science perspective. And then when we're focusing on the risk aspect, it will also be interested in terms of interesting in terms of identifying risk factors for speech and language disorders. So um, the genetic correlation results that we just saw are a first form of support for the genetic predictions of the atypical rhythm risk hypothesis. Um, we're also looking at dyslexia. So um, in a collaboration with Simon Fisher's lab, um, we have a, we've found a genetic correlation with dyslexia, and we're starting to dig in. So between rhythm impairment and dyslexia. So we're starting to dig in and, and look in more detail about what that entails right now. Okay, so summarizing new evidence for the atypical rhythm risk hypothesis. Um, rhythm traits, so scores and questionnaires are associated with, uh, fr from scores and from questionnaires are associated with increased likelihood of dyslexia and history of childhood speech and language disorders. So we saw a phenotypic correlation. Um, 
a rhythm trait, beat synchronization, and quantitative language traits are genetically correlated. Rhythm impairment, atypical beat synchronization, and dyslexia are genetically correlated. And we um, have very preliminary data suggesting that the genetic predisposition for rhythm impairment via polygenic scores is associated with increased risk of childhood speech and language disorder. So hopefully I've been able to convince you that um, musicality and rhythm are health-related states and events, and that um, these big data methods, including GWAS and pleiotropy analyses, can tell us about its distributions and potentially causal determinants in specified populations. And as we you know, continue to look at risk factors for developmental speech and language disorders, we see that they seem to be associated with rhythm impairments, and we're looking at to the extent this might be true and whether shared genetics are the, one of the many causes. Okay, I have, <laughs> I have a little bit of an FAQ um, of things that people often ask me. So I thought I would go through these really quick. So people often ask if the genetic effects are just auditory. So I think we know from other studies from fMRI data about the involvement of the motor system, even during passive listening. So it seems unlikely to me that the beat synchronization results would be only auditory. Um, and would it be worth doing a GWAS on another rhythm trait, like rhythm perception or tonal traits? Um, so yes, absolutely. And we have a brand new musicality genomics consortium where we're trying to um, get large sample sizes to, do, to look at other traits. But I do expect that they will be genetically correlated if they're phenotypically correlated, right? So if rhythm aptitude is correlated with tonal aptitude, then there's, there's probably some underlying shared genetics, but we'll have to see. Um, we've looked at FOXP2. Um, it only plays a small role because of the polygenicity of language. Um, are there plans to do GWAS and compare across genetic ancestries? There are plans to do GWAS within genetic ancestries, but not to compare across. So we really want to avoid mistakes of the eugenics history of music cognition, and you can see our ethics essay for more information about that. Um, and then when we think about cognitive mechanisms that are overlapping, I think Barbara gave us a lot to think about, about potential mechanisms that could be overlapping. And it's also possible that some pleiotropy can exist in the absence of shared cognitive mechanisms or complementing them. So um, there's many potential scenarios. I don't have to walk through all of those right now, but um, basically we're, we're really interested, you know, do genes influence rhythm and that influences development of speech and language, or are they sort of getting influenced in parallel? Um, and we're starting to have data to be able to look at these things a little bit, but it's going to take some time. But we, we hope to get other people in the genetics and music cognition fields excited about exploring these type of questions. So, um, I do spend a lot of time running around to geneticists and telling them how they should be looking at musicality because it's really interesting and exciting. <laughs> All right, um, so summarizing um, individual differences in rhythm skills and developmental language traits are correlated. We captured the polygenicity of beat synchronization using GWAS in preparation for pleiotropy studies with language. Uh, preliminary genetic correlation results su suggest shared genetic architecture between beat synchronization and language and reading traits. And future work will examine how genetics influences the neural architecture of overlapping rhythm and language traits. If you're curious to learn more and you like to listen to me ramble, um, I was interviewed on a podcast a year ago um, for the Genetics Unzipped. Um, so that was fun. Um, but uh, I really encourage you to check out a, a different podcast called In Those Genes. It's a hip-hop-inspired podcast that uses genetics to uncover the lost identities of African-descended Americans. And they did a whole um, episode on rhythm and blackness. And there's just, they only, they talked very briefly about our GWAS. It wasn't published yet. But they talk a lot about the neuroscience. And they talk a lot about um, African culture and also African-American music culture in the US. And it has, it's beautifully produced and has really great um, music in the podcast. So. Um, Please check that out. So some closing thoughts thinking about the genetic architecture of rhythm and the intersection with social communication skills. So we've seen today and we've thought about you know, the ways in which rhythm brings us together. Um, and also, it's just so nice to be here in, in person together today. I just want to reiterate that. Um, and rhythm may have even evolved to bring us together. 
And we can also think about the ways in which rhythm highlights our neurodiversity. So our brains are all wired for rhythm a little bit differently. Genetic variation drives a proportion of our individual differences. Environment plays an integral role in all sorts of other complicated biology stuff, okay? And so the end goal is not to label people as having typical or impaired rhythm. We really measure a variety of phenotypes to give us a foothold on the underlying biology um, and hopefully to find some epidemiological health applications. So I want to acknowledge um, everyone who's been involved in this work. It's very collaborative, interdisciplinary work. All the geneticists that answer all of my silly questions. Um, uh, it's been great working with 23andMe and their, um, and their team there, um, our lab, and then the generous support of our funders, especially from the NIH and the NSF. And thank you all for your attention. Okay, we've got about four or five minutes for questions before we have the panel and questions for everyone together. Questions for Reina. First of all, great presentation. It was really great seeing how you connected music and genetics. I was just interested from um, like thinking about the basal ganglia more in terms of beat perception. Um, I was wondering if you had any like methods or research on if there's a genetic basis to look at like the dopamine secretion there and if there's a connection to the beat perception. Maybe if you could elaborate more on that. Yes. Yeah. So I think so. Okay. So. Um, we're sort of on a quest now to understand the neurogenomic data resources that are like out there. And, and a lot of them are amenable to the neurogenomic data integration methods like uh, partition heritability is one method, um, uh, gene set enrichment analyses is another method, and then there's uh, other things that people are developing. Um, so there is data, um, there's data on gene expression and, and in pr very particular cell types um, at different developmental stages um, that we're going to start to look at. But um, there's sort of a balance between like being hypothesis driven, um, but then not only like cherry picking and only looking at like one thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm really paying close attention to the methods that people are using in psychiatric genetics when they do their neurogenomic data integration because a lot of times we can emulate um, those types of integration methods. I know that's not like a mechanistic answer to your question, but um, we, we're starting, yeah, we're starting to get at the biology through this and these types of integration. And so um, there are a lot of data sets that where genes have been annotated to biological function. So then it allows us to start to look at things like that. Other questions? Sean's got one up there. Is there another mic? Yeah. Thank you for your talk. It was wonderful. Uh, I had a question kind of about what, uh, what next? It's really cool that we found these like genetic things that are related, but I'm kind of looking in this broader causal picture of why these two things that are, you know, connected through language and music. It's great that they're related, but kind of what are the next questions, set of questions that we can answer now that we have a more solid evidence base to suggest that they are related at a very, very fundamental biological level? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm really, ex so there's multiple different ways. So um, on the one hand, we can get more granular and we can actually start to superimpose the G losses, not like just through plotting them, but like statistically to look at where the overlap is and then what is the function of each locus that's overlapping. And so then we can try to look at biological, cas like ca cascades of biological processes. Um, and so, so that's um, one, so getting sort of more granular in that way. And then also taking a step back and thinking about epidemiology, um, can we use genetic risk for speech and language, sorry, can we use genetic risk for rhythm impairment or atypical beat synchronization as a way to um, identify risks for speech and language disorders before kids are even being identified because they, we know that they're often not getting identified until later. Um, and, and I don't mean to lump all the speech and language disorders together, but since there are rhythm impairments in multiple, rhythm impairments are common, not deterministic, but common in multiple speech and language disorders, we're, we're interested in 
you know, sort of how this may play out for identification, but in particular for GLD. Um, so I think, yeah, trying to get it, so, sometimes I think that we can accomplish clinical aims even when we don't know the causality, but we, when, if we can see an association of a risk factor, that can still have a, a, a benefit. Um, but I think we can get at the causality through those other more granular studies. These methods, oh, yes, I don't think it was on. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so my question is about epi epigenetics and gene expression. And, you know, because we know some of these things can be, you know, across generations mm -hmm. affects. Um, have you thought about that? How does that fit into the, the picture? Yeah, so I feel like the epigenetics as a term is used in different ways by different people. So I, <laughs> um, I, I don't, um, and, we, and we have, so right now, there's, there's so much energy that's going into, in complex trait genetics, into sort of getting what the, the signal is um, in terms of very um, association with DNA um, variation, and then, and then doing these neurogenomic integration. And a lot of the neurogenomic integration is with gene expression data sets. So whether the, the cause of those is epigenetic or not, I mean, I can, I can tell you, in terms of gene expression, a portion of gene exp expression is genetically regulated. And so um, there's a particular method we're using and that Tara's gonna be using in her dissertation work, um, where based on the DNA, we can impute people's levels of gene expression in different tissues. Um, so even though we don't have access directly to like, you know, basal ganglia gene expression, for example, um, we, we can impute these levels for different, based on the, that individual's genotype, and then we can see overall that, like, how that might be associated with different phenotypes. Um, so we're starting to do that, um, and I think that will help us understand some of the mechanisms. Um, and then as, as far as also, there's other ways also to think about some of the familial effects. So. Um, we can think about like gene environment correlation. So being, um, having a, um, genetic influences that influence you <laughs> to seek out a particular environment, right? And so um, there are, are methods that people are using to look at genetic nurture where they're trying to disentangle what are some of like the genetic and familial effects that might be confounded in commonly in studies. So. I don't have a super clear explanation without <laughs> looking at my cheat sheet <laughs> on that, but, but yeah, it's sort of on the radar, so. I think we can squeeze in one more question. Any questions? I have, the, uh, that was a talk f so full of information <laughs> that I have a question that seems like so small, but I noticed, um, the, the, the question from 23andMe is, can you clap to the beat? And the options were yes and no. Uh -huh. And then in the follow-ups, they had the option of saying, I'm not sure. Uh -huh. How do you Oh, think I'll explain that, yeah, yeah. No, okay. that's actually really important. Okay, so the question from 23andMe was, can you clap in time with a musical beat? And when 23andMe asked it, the potential responses that participants could give were yes, no, and I'm not sure. So they did ask it with the I'm not sure. The thing is that they didn't, that data was not available to us. Um, the way it was coded, something. So, um, so the GWAS that we were able to get access to only had the yes versus the no. But it, I thought it would be important to reproduce sort of the original like conditions that people would be in, and the I'm not sure's were very interesting because they they fell right in the middle, right? So they like on average were more accurate tappers than than the no's, but they were less accurate tappers on average than the yeses. So you could sort of see that reflected. So in, in some ways that helps me, that helps with, I think a little bit with the validity of the self-report because it's sort of what you would expect. Um, but we would really like to get like a Likert scale question in. So a lot of, in genetics, a lot of it is like, okay, can you reduce your phenotype to one question? 
So um, we're trying to do that with our speech rhythm work, and we haven't figured out a self-report question that can capture people's speech rhythm sensitivity. If anyone has an idea for that, please come see me afterwards. Um, but for musical rhythm, we think you know that there are multiple potential like single self-report questions, but that are a little bit more nuanced um, than the one that we had here. Great. Okay. Well, that was such a great presentation. So full of information and guidance about these amazing methods. So we share your enthusiasm. Thank you for that. <laughs> Let's thank Raina one more time and then... Uh...